I was being followed by a guy on crutches. One time, I was walking home from the train station after I spent the weekend at my aunt's house. It was about 11 p.m. at night and very dark outside. When I was almost home, I noticed a guy on crutches in front of me who walked in the same direction and then stopped every couple meters to turn around and look at me before continuing to walk on. Since he was walking with a limp, I quickly passed him. When I did, he stopped walking and grinned at me in a very creepy way. I kept moving. Since I lived in an apartment over a burger restaurant, for a moment I considered to ask one of the employees to walk me to the front door, because to get to the entrance of the apartment part of the house, you had to walk around the house into a dark court. Finally, I however didn't ask, because I thought, what could possibly happen? The guy's on crutches, and I didn't want to come across as childish. So I was walking through the court of our house, and wanted to pull out my keys while walking. Suddenly, I couldn't find them in my handbag. I realized I had thrown them somewhere in my travel bag because I didn't want to lose them from my handbag while staying at my aunt's and being out with her all the time. So, still standing in the middle of the court, I had to search the whole travel bag for the damn key. I was so distracted by the whole key searching incident that I totally forgot about the creepy guy I had encountered before. When I finally pulled the key out of the bag, I looked up and the creepy guy from before was standing right in front of me, grinning. I always thought in a situation like this I'd start screaming. But instead, I couldn't get myself to make any sound at all. With the keys in my hand, I started running for the front door, opened it, and jumped inside the house. The guy still walking with a limp followed me as fast as he could. Luckily, due to his injury, he wasn't as fast as me. Unfortunately for me, our front door was one of those doors that slowly fall into the lock automatically. But when you try to push them in order to shut them quicker, it pressures back and stops you from slamming it. So there I was trying to push the door into the lock while the creepy guy was on his way to follow me into the house. Believe it or not, the door fell onto the lock right in the second he reached the doorstep. Through the glass door, we just looked at each other, both breathing heavily from the race. It looked quite disappointed. I quickly ran upstairs to my apartment and locked myself in it. Later that night, I looked outside my window and saw the same man walking up and down the road in front of my house. He stayed there for about three to four hours after the incident. I can't tell you what it is that made me not call the cops. I guess I was like, after nothing happened, what can they do about it? After that, I didn't feel safe in my home anymore because I knew that he knew where I lived. I only left my apartment when being picked up or dropped off and made sure to be home before it was turning dark every day for two weeks. Finally, I decided to go to the police and tell them about it to ask whether they could keep a special eye on the neighborhood for a bit. I went to the police station and it happened exactly how I feared it would. They took notes and said, Mm-hmm. We can't really do anything about it now. You should have called it before, but we'll make a note. A couple days passed and suddenly I get a call from another police officer who asks me a lot about what happened. He then tells me that they've been looking for the guy on crutches for months already because he molested several girls in our town, followed them into their apartments, and even stepped in front of their doors. He had been in police custody before, got out, and violated probation. He had some kind of mental illness, too. The police officer told me to immediately call in case this guy showed up again. He luckily never did. It was only then that I understood the seriousness of the situation and realized that I most likely escaped an attempted assault in some sort of way by just an inch. I, in a way, really didn't believe myself that the whole thing had actually happened before the police guy called me back. That was five years ago, but I still think about it from time to time, and it still gives me the creeps. Hey, creepy guy, let's never meet again. The night, I almost killed a home intruder. I posted the other night about my experience being followed by a red truck. My wife and I were talking about it, and she reminded me of the following story. It's mildly interesting, so I figured I'd share it. My girlfriend and I were graduate students living together in a six-unit apartment building with an outside stairwell. It was an older Victorian home that had been converted into apartments. The whole street was lined with similar buildings. It was off campus, but conveniently located within walking distance of bars, a coffee shop, and several restaurants. The neighborhood had a laid-back bohemian vibe. The tenants were a mixture of college kids, young professionals, and families. The area was generally safe, but it wasn't too far from a rougher section of the town. It was a Thursday night, and being the night owl that I am, it was past 3 a.m. 
and I had just finished the movie. I turned the TV off and went to the stairwell for a quick smoke before bed. We were in the middle of a snowstorm. The ground was covered in six inches of fresh powder, and it was freezing. Scary cold. I quickly smoked my cigarette and rushed back inside. My girlfriend was always complaining about me forgetting to lock the door, and, as was my habit, I left the door unlocked. I jumped into bed, and just as I was falling asleep, I thought I heard a noise. I brushed it off at first, but then I heard a creak. Probably just the wind, I concluded. Moments later, I heard the floorboards creaking. Now I was listening intently. My girlfriend felt me shuffling and asked what was wrong. I told her I thought I heard something. Then we both heard what sounded like someone stumbling into our couch. We shot up, and I yelled, Is someone there? No answer. The floor creaked again. This time, in unison we shouted, Who's there? Another noise. I quietly stood up and scanned the room for something that could be used as a weapon. Nothing. Growing up, my dad had always kept a baseball bat under his bed, and I regretted not adopting this practice. We yelled again, but there was no response. Again. But this time, from the darkness, we were greeted by a low-pitched, incomprehensible growl. I wondered if one of my buddies was playing a prank on me. That seemed out of character for my friends. Especially at this hour, on a weekday night, and during a snowstorm, what I really thought was that a crackhead had wandered in. My girlfriend yelled, Who's out there? More footsteps. The intruder was still in the family room, but he was getting closer to our bedroom. We heard the growl again, but this time, it was followed by a gurgle, and it's... Uh, it's Matt. We don't know any Matt's. At least not any that would enter our apartment uninvited in the middle of the night. I looked at my girlfriend. I'd never seen someone so scared. If worse came to worst, I thought to myself, I know I can outrun this bitch. I hoped it didn't come to that. Matt who? We shouted repeatedly. After a long pause, he finally said, Matt, uh, I'm friends with Mike and Kelly. Relief washed over both of us. Mike and Kelly were our neighbors. I turned on the lights and walked into the family room. There he stood, a 6'2", slovenly looking college kid. Matt was blacked out drunk. Our neighbors had hosted a pregame party at their apartment, followed by a trip to the nearby bars. They had abandoned Matt, and despite the storm, he had found his way back to their apartment. Their door was locked, and his phone calls had gone unanswered. His evolutionary drive to survive had kicked in, and he had sought warmth in the first unlocked apartment he could find. I told him that he scared the shit out of us and that he had to go. He stepped outside, and I quickly locked the door behind him. The next day, I learned that Matt froze to death. He'd been discovered by another neighbor, huddled next to her car under the lean to her garage. I'm just kidding. I have no idea what happened to Matt. I do, however, remember being a little concerned for him after my nerves got settled. University Cult Leader I was in my first semester of university. I had just graduated college not too long ago and had entered into a program that after a while, I would come to resent. During that time, with adjusting and taking daily transit an hour and a half away from where I grew up into the big city in order to study was somewhat of a new adventure to me. In a lot of ways, I was just beginning to sprout as my own individual and trying to carve a path for my life while simultaneously opening myself up to new experiences and the new environment. I have longtime friends who go to the same facility as me, but at the time, our schedules wouldn't always line up. This meant that a lot of my days were spent traveling back and forth and walking around the city alone. I really wanted to try and expand my horizon of experiences and friends during this period. In a lot of ways, I was really desiring to find a good community on campus that could help satiate my boredom and loneliness. I can be extremely extroverted, but sometimes I find that it takes a lot out of me to try and actually pursue and maintain friendships that haven't been established years prior. I've made friends before from different classes in college, but ultimately, I would end up texting less and less until eventually, either side would end up ghosting one or the other. Because I'm a busy guy, I don't find myself prioritizing people who I feel aren't as important to me as others. I know, a shitty thing to say, but nonetheless the truth. One day, however, I met Joel. I was on the phone with my fiance, and I distinctly remember exactly how it all went down. I was walking out of the old school Starbucks with a decaf coffee. I had one headphone in, 
and I was heading to class through a small stretch of underground passageway under the street that connects the school's library building to the actual building that possesses classes. As I was hastily making my way, I saw this short and stout guy, looking roughly my age at the time, with a thick brown beard and hat on. Our eyes met, and as I was about to simply walk past, he asked me something in a very charismatic and calm tone. Hey, sorry to bother you. You look like a pretty busy guy, but I was wondering, do you mind doing a survey about religion? It's for one of my classes. To this, I regret answering and wish I simply continued walking. But at the time, I was becoming more and more compelled by the notion of formal religious institutions and questioning my own religious faith, particularly leaning towards Christianity. Sure, I replied cordially. He then introduced himself as Joel, and after we went through a small survey pertaining to religious affiliations and perspectives on religions, Joel informed me that a small group of students like himself were planning on getting together as a group and discussing various religions in order to gather new insights and to create a community. Of course, with the prospect of finding some new friends on campus and also exploring my own spiritual perspectives, I gave him my number after he asked for it, and he said he would contact me in the next following days. Upon entering our first meeting, I sat down in a very crowded place with seats at our school facility and was greeted by Joel alongside a bunch of other members. They introduced themselves to me and vice versa, and they were all extremely kind to me. We began our small group meeting, and I was a bit shocked to find out that the sole topic that we were to discuss was Christianity. I wasn't aware that we were only going to be discussing Christianity, which was against what he had proposed this group to constitute upon our meeting in the tunnel. That being said, I was so curious enough to continue, and I was accompanied by three other young guys of my age, who after a bit of talking with, I found out we had a lot of similar interests. Joel, who now presented himself as the leader of our study group, relayed how we would be analyzing Christianity through a multi-step program designed to unveil the holy power associated with religion to us. Since I was curious and wanted to learn more about the religion, as well as having made some newfound friends, I continued to attend this study group for the rest of the semester in which there were a few circumstances where I questioned Joel's interpretations and was met with hard resistance. It felt like at times my wavering belief in what Joel was saying would be met with straight dismissal as opposed to actual conversation. I continued to brush that off as the group that I was working with got closer. The school's club, which I was now a part of, provided me with exactly what I had wanted. We even went to a church-run event together where I quit vaping and many individuals reported mystical experiences. Things only started to get concerning with Joel during one of our one-on-one conversations. I discussed my personal experiences and belief in my newfound religious beliefs and all my former spiritual experiences as well. And Joel exposed me to a story and a few incidents that at the time, I definitely should have taken as red flags. For example, when he was younger, he had gone on a retreat where when he was in prayer, he said that he had begun to hear the voice of God talk to him. I questioned at first if he was referring to the voice of God as more so a metaphor but he had reassured me that he literally heard God speak to him before. When he told me this, I became a bit unnerved. At the helm of this community was Joel, but in all other senses, I was satisfied with who I was and what we were doing together. Though I am not entirely dismissive of strange occurrences, especially pertaining to spirituality, his experience talking to God in his head came off as uncomfortable for me. He also said that the way that he would pray would involve a direct conversation and reply with God. Out of discomfort, I wouldn't prod him on what he meant by this. This, of course, was just the beginning. After the summer had ended, I had found myself in the most religiously devoted state I had ever been in. Throughout the summer, I had had a treacherous injury which made me housebound for months and to call upon God in a lot of ways for strength. With my newfound devotion, I was elated to fall back into the community that I had nurtured and grown with throughout the last semester, relating to something that I found deep joy in. But at the first lesson of the semester, Something was very different. Joel, as before, was at the helm of our study sessions, but was now perpetually interrupted by people coming to greet him and give him praise. It was so bad that we essentially sat and watched for 20 minutes before we can get on with our lesson, as more than 10 people, mostly young men our age, came to greet this man. As aforementioned, when not unnerving, he was extremely charming and gave the impression that he cared deeply for everyone. Once our lesson began, he introduced us to the second phase of the program, He explained that this was one of the toughest programs of the different levels there were, as it required more devotion and more importantly, an emphasis on sacrifice for those who engaged. He showed us a diagram of a small stick person, and he showed that in this program, 
we would have to accept Jesus as the center of our life. He explained that by making our lives surround Jesus entirely, that we would not be losing something, but be gaining. He also began to go over the notion that sex before marriage is a sin, and that if we were continued with this program, we would have to make the sacrifice of giving up sex in our relationships and prove that we weren't. He said that many guys weren't able to continue because of it. I talked about this afterwards with one of the members of this group, who not unlike me, had been in a serious relationship with someone they loved for years. In my personal opinion, though we weren't married on the altar, I knew both me and the other member felt devoted to our partners, as if we were already married in a sense, and we both expressed how Joel's behavior surrounding this was off-putting, controlling, and intrusive. After our lesson, I was a bit dumbfounded by the intensity with which he gave his speech about this new program that we would be engaging in this semester. Joel and I sat down for a few more minutes and talked, in which I expressed experiences of devotion from the summer and explained my entire catastrophic experience with my injury. He then went on to tell me that at times, he was actually able to know things beforehand. This seemingly random and strange statement shocked me. He said, for example, he was able to know something another member had before they had even mentioned it. And in the way that he described it, it sounded as if he was saying that he had some form of mystical foresight. I was a bit jarred to say the least though. I felt like it would be impolite to question any further. Joel then went on to tell me that he believed that I, if I successfully completed this program, was primed to become a teacher for the first program I had done the semester prior, leading others who would join, and that I had a bright future in the organization. In that moment, with what he had laid down on us in the lesson, I felt overwhelmed by his expectations of me. It also became evident that Joel was not a student at our facility. In fact, he was in his mid-30s and had kids. He was actually just a part of an organization that recruits people to become Christians and missionaries that works on our campus. This meant that he actually lied to me when I had first met him. He wasn't a student. There was no group talking about various religions, and his whole purpose was to convert me to make me join the organization he was a part of. At this point, school began to pick up a lot, and I was also working part-time to help support myself. As I was on the train to head back home the next week, I had forgotten that my second lesson of the program that semester was supposed to happen. So I texted Joel saying, Hey man, I actually got onto the train and forgot about our lesson. Sorry about that, dude. I'm not going to be able to make it. I also have work later. To which he replied, Can you get off of the train? Try and get here as soon as possible. I was a bit dumbfounded at this question. Since I live an hour and a half away, it wasn't as easy as getting off of the train and heading back the opposite direction. And he knew that. He knew that the area I live in is remote and a long distance away. I also told him that I have to work, which he had plainly disregarded. No man, unfortunately I can't come. Have a good lesson. I replied, to which he said again, Come on man, just get off the train and come back. At this point I was annoyed. Not only did I feel like he was commanding me, but that he was also blatantly disregarding the fact that I said no, and that I have work that day. So, I didn't answer him. I talked to my fiancé about how I was starting to feel about the whole idea ordeal and how I felt guilty about having feelings of wanting to distance myself from the group, while simultaneously not wanting to lose the community and friends that I had established along the way. My fiancé told me that the way Joel was acting, and with regards to the things that he said, that she was starting to become uncomfortable with the whole situation. I remember sitting in bed thinking about leaving the group, and how the prospect made me feel physically ill. After all, I had been given everything I wanted in a community, except that the helm was a seemingly increasingly controlling, and persuasive being who was making me and possibly other members more miserable. There was an event the following Friday that was going to be at the church, which was organized by the community. Originally, since many of my friends from this group were going, I intended to go, but alas, I was scheduled by my boss to work that day, so there was no way I was going to be able to attend. I knew that Joel would be insistent upon me coming anyways, so when Joel texted me reminding me that the event was Friday, I told him that I wasn't able to go because I had work. To this he replied, and simply said, What? Bro, no way. You gotta come. Take off work and find somebody to take your shift. God wants you there. As I expected, he dismissed my decision, and also said that I had to be there because God wanted me there, as if he was his mouthpiece. I went on to text him again, and informed him, No, sorry man, I cannot do that. I just got a promotion and I have to be there. I hope you guys have a great time anyways to which he then again replied similarly to what he had before. This was my personal breaking point. He knew the importance of my financial situation, and his dismissal of my personal boundaries, as well as his commanding, made me decide to text him explaining that I was done with the group, 
and that I wanted to pursue my own religious exploration without the group from then on. I felt as if he was slowly, but surely increasingly controlling me and trying to take what he could, commanding me as if he were the leader of my life in any way possible. It was even up to him if I could sleep with my fiance. He replied with a long paragraph, persisting in this sort of overly kind manner that I had to continue with the group and that it was God's will for me to show up to this event, even though I was completely unable. He was certain that this group was meant for me and that God had told him that this was where I was supposed to be. After I responded again telling him to stop and that I would not, he sent me another paragraph of similar length, repeating what he would say. No matter what I would say and whenever I would say no, he would overstep my boundaries while maintaining a kind and friendly tone in order to try and push me into submission when I had clearly said no. At this point, I said I did not want him to talk to me anymore, to which he replied, Bro, why? Can we meet up? I want you to explain why you don't want to continue, bro, so we can meet up and do that, and I can get a better sense and we can figure out what we can do from there. Even this, I knew he was trying to elongate his chances of bringing me back into the group and continuing his reign of control. I said I didn't want to, so he asked again. I decided at that moment that I needed to block him, so I did. A semester later, I was walking down the street of my school, and as I walked by a pizza parlor, lo and behold who came out. Joe walked over to me with one of his friends, and said that I was one of his friends to his buddy. I uncomfortably stood there, and his friends went inside for a moment while Joel turned around to look at me, and asked with his disarming gentleness, Did you block me? I replied, Yes. He then said, You shouldn't block me. That way we can meet up, and talk, because I want to know why you left the group. To which I evidently was frustrated, and said, Okay. I went on my way. That night he texted me on Instagram insisting we meet up again, and I blocked him there too. In short, I'm thankful for my fiancé who was the love of my life. Without her, I'm not sure I would have been strong enough to have left the group and his control. The fact of the matter is that there were other guys in that group who had absolutely nobody. They had nothing, and they were prime targets for a charismatic and controlling freak. There were members of that group who were in higher levels, so to speak, who had done all the programs, who seemed as if they were emaciated, but they had become such restricted fundamentalists that their lives and their openness to new experiences were significantly thwarted. Beware of who you let into your life, and just because somebody is nice to you does not mean they might not have ulterior motives. Also, learn to stand your ground and respect yourself. If you say no, mean it. So Joel, you controlling cult leader, let's never meet again. Laced Cigarette A few years back, when I was around 18, I entered a very rebellious phase in my life. I have always been a prodigy child, always did what I was told, never stayed out late, didn't smoke, didn't drink, scored the highest in all of my classes, all my family, my friends, and my friends' families, thought I was the perfect child. But then something changed. I was on a lot of medication due to my health, and I started going through bouts of depression. I started acting up like never before. I stopped going to school, I would stay in bed all day, didn't talk to anyone, and then, slowly, I started talking to strangers online. Initially, it was just talking to them online. I would talk to a few people till I found someone interesting, would dedicate all my time talking to them till they no longer held my interest, and then moved on to the next person. This went on for about a year, then I eventually started meeting these people in person. Most of these meetings were sexual. I was very reckless. I stepped around with more people than I'd like to admit. And regardless of my lack of concern for my own safety, I somehow never met anyone that had any evil intentions. We'd meet a couple of times, through the dirty, and that was that. Until I met this one guy. I was talking to a couple of guys at that time. I wasn't in any sort of relationship, just talking around. So this guy starts talking to me and asks me about my hobbies, my interests, what I do. I told him that I don't smoke or drink, and he was shocked. I told him it wasn't that I'd never done it. I tried, but just felt like it wasn't my thing. We talked for a couple of weeks. I ended up talking about how I've been through depression, and at first, he just listened. Eventually, he started telling me I should try smoking. It would help me relieve my anxiety and stress, and I always turned it down, but he was relentless. After a month or so of talking online, we decided to meet. We had never had any sort of sexual conversation or anything, so we were just going to meet his friends. I was supposed to meet another guy, an acquaintance, for something I needed, 
so I suggested to the online chat guy that we meet briefly for lunch and that he can drop me off at the other guy's place. He agreed, and we decided on where and when to go. The day we were supposed to meet, we met at a local cafe, we had brunch, and then I got in his car for him to drop me off at the place I had to go. It was a good 45 minute drive, so I put on some songs and decided to relax. Five minutes into the drive, he offered me a cigarette. I declined, but he insisted, and kept insisting until I gave up and agreed. I opened the box and there was only one cigarette in there. I told him that it was the last one, and asked if he was sure he wanted me to smoke it, since he would have enjoyed it more than I. He said yes, and I took the cigarette out. There was something odd about it. It didn't look like it was store-bought. It looked like it had been rolled by hand. But then again, I had never smoked enough cigarettes to be sure. So I lit it and smoked it. I couldn't even smoke half of it. It made me inexplicably nauseous. So I gave up halfway through and offered it to him. Instead of smoking it, he put it out and threw it away. I thought it was weird, but assumed he probably didn't want to smoke while driving. 30 minutes into the ride, I started feeling very sick. My whole body was shaking. I was extremely nauseous and I could barely keep my eyes open. I kept telling him I wasn't feeling good and that maybe we should go to the nearest ER instead of where we were going. But he kept telling me to relax and lay back. Everything about that ride felt off. I told him to stop the car and drop me off wherever we were. He refused. All I could think of was pulling out my phone and calling the police. When he noted what I was doing, he immediately stopped the car and I got off. I couldn't stand so I sat on the roadside and called the guy I was supposed to visit. He immediately drove to where I was picked me up and took me to his place where I threw up all over his living room multiple times. For the next hour and a half, I just laid on the couch, my whole body shaking and constantly throwing up. The guy brought me water and gave me some electrolytes and kept insisting on going to the hospital, but I refused. I had no idea what I had smoked, but I was sure it wasn't just plain old cigarettes. I was scared if it had been some illegal drug and if the hospital caught on, I would get into trouble and I absolutely did not want my parents to find out what I had been up to. So I laid there, kept throwing up, and letting whatever this shit was get out of my system. All of these years later, I am now married to the guy who picked me up from the roadside and helped me through an insanely embarrassing time. Oh, and to that guy who laced my cigarette, let's not meet. I don't know if I would have made it out of the woods if I had done what he wanted me to do. Hello, I just came across this subreddit and gosh, some of these are terrifying. I do have a story of something that happened to me from a long time ago, but in hindsight, it was really dumb of me and I feel terribly dumb now. So I've always been hesitant to tell a lot of people I know about it, except for my psychiatrist. And I always apologize for long posts, so it's hard not to hear. There were some other conversations that I had with this man named John but I left some of them out for length's sake. This was a few years ago. It was pretty late, past 1.30 or 2 a.m. I was living with this boy who was pretty abusive and he had gotten really jealous at this party we were at earlier that night. Not even an hour after we had gotten home, he tossed me out onto the front porch and locked the door behind me. I was knocking and pleading for him to please let me back inside. I was still wearing what I had worn to the party and it was freezing out. I wasn't sure what to do. He had my phone, purse, and wallet in the house with him. So I sat on the porch crying. When he turned off the lights both inside and outside of the house, I knew he wasn't going to let me back in. I felt so hopeless and cold. I thought about knocking on the neighbor's door, but I had anxiety about waking any of them up and causing trouble for my boyfriend. So instead, I decided I would try to walk to this gas station and motel so I could use their phone and try to call a girlfriend of mine to see if I could sleep over with her. Ironically enough, the road I was walking on was Donner Pass Road so the freezing cold was fitting. But anyways, a little into the walk, this tall white pickup truck was approaching on the opposite side of the road I was on. I tried not to make eye contact for obvious reasons, but then I heard the truck stopping and beginning to make a U-turn, and my heart just started pounding. I just about froze up, but forced myself to speed walk at the very least. The truck pulled up to me, and this guy rolled down his window and asked what I was doing out this late. I told him how I was going to meet my friend at the gas station and that she was expecting me. He sort of smiled and offered me a ride. I said no thank you, citing that I shouldn't hitchhike. He told me, Well good, I don't pick up hitchhikers, or anyone. You don't look like a hitchhiker though, you just look like you need some help. He just kept driving next to me and told me that I shouldn't think that he was a creep, and he pulled out what looked like a police badge, and told me he had just gotten off duty, which is why he was in civilian clothes and out so late. 
He said he wouldn't mind driving next to me just to make sure I get to where I was heading safely. I was naive and a bit too trusting of his kindness and credentials. And when he offered me a ride again, I said that it would be nice because the gas station wasn't that far away anyway. He popped the door open and I hopped in. The radio was low. It was a little messy. The ashtray was full of cigarettes. There were a lot of newspapers on the passenger floor. As I was moving my feet, some of the papers shifted showing a pair of handcuffs, some coffee cups, empty water bottles, rags, a highlight colored bandana, and some other things. He apologized saying that it was the truck he took hunting, but it was super warm, so I was happy and didn't mind at all. He told me his name was John. He asked why I was scantily dressed without a jacket, and I started to tell him about the party and the fight I had been in with my boyfriend. He was super charming and attentive. He even laughed that he could go back and arrest him. I asked about him and he told me about his family. He was a young dad. He had a wife and daughter, a son and a dog. And I told him that it was like he had a perfect little family. And he laughed and said he certainly did. Then, it had sort of clicked for me to ask him if I could use his phone. But he said no because he had to save his battery. We were approaching the gas station and he drove right past it. I politely said, Oh, I think that's the one. But he didn't answer me. I felt sick to my stomach and my heart started pounding. I started getting choked up. My eyes started tearing up as I was looking out the windows and watching the lights behind us getting further and further away. It was hard for me to even speak out, but somehow I murmured, asking if he would please turn around and he ignored me. Whenever I would look at him, he just looked empty-eyed and emotionless, totally dead and glazed. I looked back out the window and down the road to see if maybe we were going slow enough that I could make a leap out of the car without seriously injuring myself. I remember always hearing, never go to the second location, but I thought about the possibility of jumping out and breaking an ankle and how it would be a lot harder to get away with one foot as opposed to two, debating with myself that there was snow on the ground. But then again, snow is hard to get along with, especially when you're not fully clothed. I felt so dumb now too, because I wasn't even tied up or anything. I was just so scared, like there was nothing but trees, an empty road, and us. I was crying pretty badly at this point and asked if I could please borrow his phone again, and he told me to stop talking. Then he started talking underneath his breath, saying, Girl shouldn't be out so late. You shouldn't have been alone this late. Look at what you're doing to me, dressed like a spit. And other derogatory things, as he kept saying these terrible things, I wasn't even responding. I was just crying and trying to think past the fear I was feeling. I remember the pair of handcuffs. I remember seeing under the papers beneath my feet. So I used that little, I don't know how to describe it, like scoopy motion. And I managed to use my feet to scoop the handcuffs up and use my heels and toes to push them under the bottom of my seat as far as I could. I was thinking of different things I could do to try to help myself. Like if we were close enough to some upcoming lights or structures, I could just grab the wheel and cause us to crash into them. Or maybe how if I got lucky enough for a cop to pass us, I could grab the wheel and swerve so we would appear to be a drunk driver and we'd get pulled over. I guiltily thought about the possibility of this man is just having a weird night and how if I did anything it would hurt him. But I told myself that sort of thinking sort of got me into this mess. He pulled off road where there was still woods on both sides of us. On his side the wooden trees were closer to the road than on mine and there was a small gap fully covered in thick snow before the trees thickly picked up maybe 10 to 16 yards away. He turned off his car and coldly said that there was something wrong with the car and to get out with him. As he grabbed the keys and was stepping out of the car, I grabbed onto the center console and cried and pleaded not to make me get out with him because it was too cold. He turned around to face me, his door still open and shouted at me to get out of the car because we had to go check the trunk bed hatch. I dug my fingernails deeper into the console, thinking my cries of no and head shaking would cause him to come around to my side of the car and drag me out himself. I was crying and said, Please, John, I'm so cold and scared. I was thinking of everything I've ever heard. Humanize yourself. Use first names. He stared at me in this way, like I can't even describe it to this day. I don't even know how to start. He got back in the car, and I slinked towards my window, scared he would drag me over the console. He turned off the headlights, and everything just looked dark blue. He stared at his steering wheel for what felt like years, before lighting a cigarette looking out his window, back at me, and then back out his window. He heard me shuffle my feet on the newspapers. I was just adjusting my legs, but while still staring out his window, told me that if I thought about running, he had a quick way to get me where he wanted. And oddly enough, I was sort of thinking of running minutes before that, 
but reasoned that if he wanted me out of the car, then I should definitely stay in. Otherwise he could chase me or shoot me. I'm glad I was right. I think at that point, I sort of hit the bottom of my reserve and instead of panic, there was numbness and exhaustion. There was still an occasional hot tear or two, but I just remember being numb. I talked to a psychiatrist about this sort of feeling and he thinks it came from my ex-boyfriend's giving me PTSD. It was dead quiet, but I finally, just barely audibly, told him that my friend was still waiting for me and asked about his wife and children and he flatly said he didn't have a wife or children and that his house was empty. I asked him what he was thinking about and he said, I'm thinking of what to do with you. He didn't say it angrily. He just said it flatly and coldly, which sort of scared me more. I did start getting worked back up to a cry at that point and he told me not to cry and turned the car on, offering me some heat, but I just cried and said I wanted to go home. Eventually he started driving and kept driving until we were approaching a gas station. I was gauging the right time to reach for the wheel, but before I could, he started slowing down. While pulling up, he told me not to tell anyone or he would find me. Then he told me that he was doing this to teach me a lesson not to hitchhike with strangers. He was almost coming to a complete stop when he told me to get out before he changes his mind. Before he could get another look at me to assess my understanding, I was already down out the truck and sprinting towards the gas station. The panic was overwhelming me, but then I stopped and remembered to try to see his license plate. I turned around but only caught the blur of the last three numbers as he was driving off. I ran inside and asked the clerk on the counter to please call the police. I waited until the officer got there, and I'll be honest, I was a little scared it would be John. My fears melted away when the new face policeman got there. I gave him the description of John, his appearance, the vehicle color and type, the parts of the license plate number I had caught, the fact that he said he was an off-duty cop, just basically anything I could. I asked him if he could look at the camera and the officer disappeared in the back for a little bit, then came back out saying there was nothing on them. I asked if I would be able to look, and the officer said no, and asked me if I didn't trust him. I told him of course I did. The officer then gave me a ride to my friends, lecturing me for hitchhiking, consisting of him repeatedly asking if I knew who Ted Bundy was. I never heard anything back about the report that was made, so I would try to follow up, and each time I did, they never got back to me aside from the one time I was told my case number didn't exist but that didn't stop me from trying to follow up. Throughout the months and years, I asked my friend if any weirdness or anything like that incident had happened to her or anyone up there, and she only says no. So I sort of let it go and try to tell myself that maybe he actually was trying to teach me a lesson or something. I mean, I definitely never hitchhiked again. So if it was a lesson, it certainly worked. I never heard anything back having to do with the case. I never heard of any other odd experience up there. Maybe it was just one man trying to teach me something. But honestly, sometimes I think I tell myself all that to help me sleep better at night. It all felt really real. Even if it wasn't real, I'm really glad I didn't get out of the car in the woods that night. That's all for this video. Let me know which story was your favorite down in the comments. And shout out to our cool crew members. You can also join by clicking the link in the description. But you can also support the channel for free by simply subscribing and leaving a like. Anyways, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.